Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. I'm Nikki Jobikik from Lookup Strata and for this Queensland Q&A webinar session, I'm very happy to welcome Jessica Cannon from Cannon & Co Law. Today we're talking about caretakers and agreement extensions in Queensland Bodies Corporate. Please note any legislation mentioned during the session will be specifically referring to Queensland legislation. Jessica has a presentation in a short while and then we'll be moving on to the Q&As. Please feel free to share this recording with neighbours, committee members, other staff members or anyone you think will be interested in the session. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that the information contained in this session, including the discussions that arise from submitted questions, is not legal advice and should not be relied upon as legal advice. You should seek independent advice before acting on the information contained in this session. I'm delighted to introduce our panellists today, Jessica Cannon from Cannon & Co Law. Jessica graduated with a Bachelor of Laws and Bachelor of International Relations from Bond University in 2011, being awarded the Dean's Law Award for her achievements in her final semester. Jessica was then admitted to the Supreme Court of Queensland and the High Court of Australia in January 2012. Jessica now has over nine years experience in body corporate law. She works predominantly for bodies corporate and committees, but will also represent caretakers. Jessica has acted for some of the biggest and smallest community title schemes on the Gold Coast and Brisbane. She considers it important to understand and have experience in all sides of a community title scheme and accordingly being involved and acting for owners and caretakers is invaluable in her knowledge, approach and dispute resolution skills. Jessica is on the Legislative Review Committee for the SCA in Queensland, ensuring she's not only up to date with current laws, but pending future changes as well. Jessica is a contributor to the Lookup Strata blog and her Q&As have appeared in the Queensland Strata magazine. We regularly receive questions, sometimes controversial questions, about management rights. One of our Q&A articles on this topic, originally published way back in 2015, but updated regularly, has received almost 15,000 views and have, has had over 20 comments. So certainly we see lots of interest in this topic. I'll leave you to carry out your presentation, Jessica, and I'll join you in a little while to cover this, the Q&A part of the session. Welcome. Thank you, Nikki, and thank you for the kind uh, introduction. Good morning, everybody. Uh, as Nikki said, and I'm just going to share my screen with you all uh, for this morning, today's topic that we've got uh, is most certainly a, a controversial one. There are a, a number of schools of thought out there, um, especially of recent times, which is going to um, caretaking and letting agreements, but specifically their extensions. And, and when I say extensions, I'm talking about um, extensions of the terms. So I do have a lot of content to get through today. <clears throat> I am going to try and keep it as short and succinct as possible. Um, we have had a number of questions that have been submitted um, and they're all very good questions. So I'm gonna try and get through the content um, as quickly and succinctly as possible so that we can get onto those questions today. Um, now, I guess what, what, what the driver for today's webinar is, is there has been some alternative schools of thought put out there recently. Um, and those schools of thought go to uh, the, the extensions and the ability for caretakers to top up um, their agreements and whether there should be or is a cap on what those extensions and top up should be. I'm going to kick off the webinar by saying what my thoughts are, um, at, at least as an initial overview. I'll get into the nitty gritties of, of the legislation to provide you with some context about how I came to um, my thoughts and my position on um, extensions and terms. I'll do a couple of case law studies in there because they really support what, what my thoughts and my position are. I'll touch on whether a body corporate can reasonably say no, and this plays into a few of the questions that Nikki has kindly sent through to me. Um, and I will wrap up with um, what these other schools of thoughts are out in the industry at the moment, so that you can see what the context is and, and how others are interpreting the legislation too. So, Let's get straight into it. Now, ultimately, the school of thought that has derived a lot of discussion in the industry at the moment is whether the legislation should be interpreted insofar as placing a statutory life 
um, um, on a caretaking and letting agreement. And what I mean by that is whether the legislation was intended to cap a subsequent right or option to one option per originating um, agreement. I'll go into a little bit more depth about this school of thought later. Um, however, from an initial viewpoint, and in my opinion, I don't read the legislation to be that clear to support that position. Um, it's not that I don't agree that there should be some form of cap on caretaking and letting agreements, but it's more so that a statutory interpretation of those sections, in my opinion, does not support a, a, a definite cap as it stands now. Now, I think there is merit in the argument, um, and I think it would be extremely interesting to see how the tribunals and, and courts sit on the issue. But as it stands now, there isn't a decision that at least I'm aware of um, that goes to answering that specific question. And that goes to answering whether um, there is a statutory life span of a caretaking and letting agreement and a cap on those subsequent rights and options. From a legal viewpoint, until we have a decision from the tribunals or the courts to that effect, it's difficult to interpret or understand the merits of, of the argument. Um, but irrespective, and, and in my opinion, and this will be the general theme of, of my webinar today, is that there is already, in my opinion, a cap on the existing caretaking and letting agreements. And that is a 25 year term for accommodation modules and a 10 year term for standard modules. Um, body corporates are, are under no obligation uh, whatsoever to agree to subsequent rights and, and options to extend the terms. And there is definitely a misconception in the industry that body corporates are rubber stamp when it comes to these. And I'll again go into a lot more detail about this and give you some case law to support why I have come to this position. Um, I, I'm a, a big advocate for saying that body corporates are entitled to have a say um, and they are entitled to pass a no vote um, to a motion which proposes a subsequent right or option. Um, and there are decisions out there that provide that such a, a defeated motion and such a no vote is reasonable of a body corporate to take that position as well. Um, I agree with, with a lot of the schools of thought in the sense that there are misconceptions and there are some myths in the industry about these automatic rights to, to, to do this indefinite top up. Um, but in my opinion, in order to break that current cycle, um, really owners need to be more educated about what the body corporate's legal position is, what a body corporate can lawfully and reasonably say no to. And we need to be able to remember what the legislation says now um, and how case law is interpreting that now. Um, so let's get into how I come to this position and this thought process. So I'm not gonna read out the legislation to you because it is quite boring to, to read it out. I'm just going to give you a summary of it. I am going to focus today's webinar on the accommodation module because I do feel that most disputes stem from those bigger term agreements, which obviously are derived from the accommodation module schemes. So section 130 of the accommodation module is what dictates what a term of a caretaking and letting agreement can be. Now I break up section 130 into two parts. The first part deals with what I'm going to term in this webinar as your originating agreement. And when I say originating agreement, I mean a caretaking and lending agreement, a management and lending agreement, a deed of authorization, a deed of engagement, the agreement that kicks off the contractual relationship between the body corporate and the caretaker. But subsection one of section 130 provides that that term of the engagement of the service contractor cannot be or must not be longer than 25 years long. Now, subsection two then goes into the subsequent rights and options. And importantly, as you'll see my emphasis there is on the word may. So the body corporate may 
um, decide or resolve to give a subsequent right or option here. And this will give a little bit more detail um, to in a little minute. But this, in my mind, breaks this section down. You've got your term under your original agreements, which must not be more than 25 years. And then you've got your discretionary ability to top up or extend. Um, now, that extension and that top up does have some limitations, can't be longer than more um, or can't be longer than five years. And the unexpired term can't be longer than 25 years in that. So what is your unexpired term then? How do we define that? Well, the accommodation module does define it. And it is, is somewhat confusing in how it is worded. However, can be simplified to say that um, essentially the un, uh, unexpired term is going to be the remaining term on any original agreement or originating agreement, um, plus or in addition to any subsequent right or option which has been exercised under subsection two. What it means is that as at the date of a general meeting resolution being passed um, for a subsequent right or option, that remaining term, however it is broken up, whether it's in an originating agreement or whether it is in a, a subsequent top up, cannot be longer than 25 years for accommodation module schemes. It's important then for us and, and, and to turn our mind to, okay, well, this is what the legislation says about maximum terms of the agreements, um, but how did the legislature read or, or, or come to that decision? What was the basis, the intent, the purpose behind placing in these maximum term provisions? Um, and again, without boring you, I've, I've taken a few paragraphs of um, the 2002 explanatory notes, which I think summarises the intent behind these. Um, importantly, what the explanatory notes provide is that the limitation on the agreements is seen as balancing the rights of the body corporate as a whole as against a single person in a body corporate whose contractual rights were potentially imposed over the um, wishes of the body corporate without the opportunity for renegotiation. Now, these parts are really important because it recognises the fact that um, ultimately your originating agreement would have been um, um, developed and, and imposed on the body corporate by the developer. And the, the, the peculiar part of management rights is that the developer then usually sells out and ultimately you have two parties bound by a contract and its contractual terms, but they had no say and no involvement in the negotiation of what those contractual terms are. So the legislature has obviously turned their mind to the fact of saying, okay, we need to balance these rights. We need to respect the fact that a caretaker has a, a, a contractual and a, and a commercial vested interest in these agreements. But we also have a body corporate who wants to see somebody perform and wants to see that the remuneration that they're paying pursuant to this contract is, is, is coming back and receiving a benefit for all the owners. So that paragraph there really summarises a, a good understanding of why these maximum terms were looked at and imposed because of this balancing between the two related entities attached to them. Now, interestingly, um, at page 65 of the explanatory notes, the legislature also provided that the opportunity therefore remains with the body corporate not to extend any contract. Mm -hmm. The secret ballot will minimise the influence of letting agents and service contractors over the granting of an extension. The amendment returns to the body corporate the control over the letting authorization or the service contract engagements, as well as giving a reasonable time for, ex for the existing contracts to run. Now, this, in my opinion, again, supports what I was talking about earlier, that these subsequent rights and options are discretionary on a body corporate. There is the ability for the body corporate to essentially say no um, to an extension of these agreements. And the very purpose of why these type of motions to top up 
um, have been mandated to be by way of secret ballot is to respect the fact that owners may feel a level of pressure um, in voting a certain way. So they wanted to allow some secrecy in that so that owners felt free to pass the vote as they see fit. Um, again, I'll, I'll wrap up and touch on this a little bit more, but I feel that those two paragraphs do give some good scope and some good understanding to um, the concept behind these maximum terms. I'm going to move into now the industry standard or, or what I at least experience as the industry practice at present. And, and the reason is, is I think, A, it's a good, useful tool to break down how Section 130 is currently being practiced, um, but to, two, to also give some scope around these schools of thought, which I'll get to in a minute. So again, focusing on the accommodation schemes, and like I said before, um, I read Section 130 subsection one to really deal with your originating agreements and the term that can be contained within them. Now, as we've said, the term is a 25 year term, but that can be broken down in a number of different ways. So you could have a, a, an agreement in front of you that has a full lump sum 25 year term. So you have your commencement date in 25 years time, you have your end date. The other way that you see this term broken down is in an initial term plus some options. So for instance, you could have an initial term of 10 years and then three times five year options. That's pretty standard in the industry as well. Um, the difference that I want to draw on here between the options contained within originating agreements and subsequent rights and options are very different. And, and this is why. There is usually in originating agreements contractual requirements on how the caretaker has to exercise that option. So, for example, um, a common one I see a lot of is that the caretaker has an obligation to provide written notice to the body corporate of no more than six months, however, no less than three months um, from the expiration of the current term um, of its notification to exercise the option. So, this is commonly referred referred to as preconditions. There are conditions built within the originating agreement which mandates that the, the caretaker has to do certain things to properly and accurately exercise that option. Now, these clauses can um, change quite dramatically and vary quite dramatically. Um, there can be greater preconditions on caretakers. There can be almost automatic preconditions on caretakers. But the point is, is that that contractual obligation rests with the caretaker. Um, and that's why it is so important for any um, persons involved in, in strata titles and management rights to get some advice about what those contractual terms mean for you and your role. So if a caretaker fails to exercise an option or fails to meet its contractual preconditions, um, for instance, it fails to serve a notice at all or it fails to serve a notice outside of the time period allowed, there could be um, grounds for a body corporate to deem the agreements as ended, meaning that they've expired, they've lapsed, um, and the, the, the body corporate is at liberty to essentially draft new agreements and, and, and take um, on new caretakers based on new agreements. Um, the contractual obligation, as I mentioned, it is, it is one that rests with the caretaker. However, the difference is, and, and the important part for bodies corporate is to check that those options are being properly and correctly exercised. Um, more often than not, most of the deeds of variation and the deeds of assignment that we see, um, they have a form of acknowledgement, acceptance, ratification um, that the body corporate is asked to give that confirms the proper and correct exercising of previous options. Now, if that recognition, that acknowledgement is given in that deed, and in fact, you know, the caretaker did not exercise the, the option previously or correctly, um, there could be grounds there, well, there would probably be reasonable grounds there to say, oh, well, the body corporate's accepted that, um, it's recognised that, it's acknowledged that, it's difficult to try to unwind that clock. So it is important from a body corporate's viewpoint to check that those contractual um, preconditions are, are met and satisfied.
Now, so long as the caretaker satisfies its preconditions and contractual requirements, it is difficult for the body corporate to challenge the exercise of these type of options. Um, most of the agreements, there is no requirement for the exercise of the option to be subject to a, a further body corporate approval or at the very least a committee approval. And that's the important part here. The reason for this is that the body corporate agreed when granting those originating agreements, agreed to those terms, irrespective of those terms being broken down into some options, it agreed from the outset to be bound by those options and to be bound by the caretaker's ability to exercise those options based on the preconditions within them. And that's a big difference here, because as I'll get to in a minute with your subsequent rights and options, it's a totally different request on the body corporate. So summary for that point then is that it, the body corporate is bound by its acceptance um, and the only governance when it comes to options built into originating agreements is to ensure that the caretaker honours its contractual obligations about how and when that option is being exercised as well. There was a recent decision on this, which was Santorini by the Sea. I'm pretty sure it was handed down on the 9th of August, 2021. It went into this in, in quite a considerable detail about the preconditions what was required of the caretaker to satisfy them. Um, if anybody needed or wanted to have a read, that would be a good decision to do so because it gives some scope about how it could be interpreted and ultimately what the caretaker had to do to exercise. Now, what is entirely different to options included in originating agreements is a subsequent right or option. And this is what is found in subsection two of section 130. Now, while they are similar terminology to options, um, and again, we see a lot of confusion and rightfully so from owners and committee members on this, while they use the options terminology, it's very different. And that is because what the caretaker is asking for is an additional right or option outside of the originating agreement. So put simply, the caretaker is asking for the body corporate uh, for something that falls outside of the terms previously agreed to in the originating agreement. So a subsequent right or option triggers the requirement for a body corporate approval at general meeting, which means that the body corporate, i.e. owners, have a greater level of say when it comes to approving or refusing a subsequent right or option. This is obviously very different to an option that is built into originating agreements, which generally don't um, see any type of trigger for a further body corporate approval to be given. Um, now, a subsequent right or option must be considered by um, ordinary resolution, by way of secret ballot um, and without the use of proxies. The secret ballot requirement gives owners the opportunity to anonymously have their say on the motion without the fear of adverse uh, repercussions in the event that they vote no to the subsequent right or option. And, and that's an important point, especially considering the explanatory notes from 2002, there was a recognition and the legislature obviously turned their mind to the fact of appreciating that owners might feel a little bit uncomfortable, um, might not want their votes to be known. And that's why this secret ballot um, um, requirement was imposed in there. So to seek a subsequent right or option, the caretaker must submit a motion, which we've gone to submit a deed of variation. And this was a point that, that Nikki has kindly um, sent through to me or a question from one of the participants today is what is actually needed in that deed of variation? Um, and, and does that need to attach the, the, the current agreement so owners know what they're voting on? Um, I'll get to the answer later, but in simple forms, the deed of variation is a couple of pages long. It's a relatively straightforward document, um, but ultimately it just goes to body corporate authorising and approving an additional term being built into those original agreements. There is also another requirement for um, the motion to be submitted with a BCCM Form 20. 
And this acts as an explanatory note. It acts as a way to try to educate owners and, and bring to owners' attention um, that they're aware of the nature of the amendment which is being requested, requested from them. In similarity to that, there are limitations on subsequent rights and options, um, those being that only one motion um, and deed uh, can be considered each financial year of the body corporate. So let's say that your financial year is from um, July to June and you have an AGM and, and your caretaker puts up a motion and that motion um, ultimately fails, it wouldn't be open to that caretaker to submit another motion for a top up until the next financial year. Now, the subsequent right or um, option um, cannot be more than five years at any one time. So you know, we've seen all different types of timeframes thrown in there. We've seen, you know, four months, uh, four years and 11 months. We've seen three years and six months. So long as the cap, that 25-year cap or 10-year cap for standard modules is not exceeded, that's generally what your top-up period will look like in the motion. Um, and again, the remaining term cannot be greater than 25 years at, at any time. So that's generally where you see the working of, well, how much longer do we have on our unexpired term? What can we ask for in, in a top up motion? Now, some case law, and, and Nikki and I had a good chat about this before we jumped on this morning, and this does touch on quite a few of the questions that we've already received today. And that's a question about, well, can a body corporate reasonably say no to a subsequent right or option? Now, the Castaway Cove decision is fantastic. For anyone out there that, again, wants to have a light read, it's not a long one. Um, this decision went to a caretaker who put up a motion for a top up Ultimately, it was um, refused, tried to challenge it on the grounds of unreasonability and, and the adjudicator came down. And I've extracted a paragraph there, but the final paragraph for me is, is, is absolute gold. And the reason is, be, is because the adjudicator said, I consider that there is nothing inherently unreasonable in owners passing a resolution that expresses their view that the scheme work works towards a situation of no on-site caretaking. And that's important because it gives scope to the ability of owners to be able to pass a no vote. And it plays into the statutory interpretation of clause or section 130 subsection two, whereby it says the body corporate may, not must, not shall, the body corporate may. And this decision supports that. It supports the fact that there is not a mandatory requirement for an extension to be granted. It comes down to um, whether the body corporate can you know, reasonably say no. And in most cases, I would suspect that they can. Now, another good um, um, extract from these reasonings is the following. Caretakers were or should have been aware when they purchased the management rights of the term of the agreement and that the body corporate had no obligation to extend or renew the agreements. Now, this is a good point here because the, the, the adjudicator in this decision concluded by saying arguably caretakers must earn an extension or renewal by providing good service to all owners, whether in the letting pool or not in the scheme. This is the nature of the management rights industry. So this decision really supports um, the argument and, and the thought that ultimately it is a discretionary right of owners to choose on whether they wish to extend in their caretaking and lending agreements. Now, I'm not saying that there, there might not be any circumstances um, that would be considered unreasonable to vote against it, but you know, in this decision, ultimately owners wanted to work towards no on-site caretaking, um, and that was found to be a reasonable basis for, for, for the owners to pass a no vote. It also supports a, an underlying or, or, or a perceived perception that you know, top ups and extensions are something that is given because of good performance um, or because you know, ultimately the parties are amicable, they're both happy with their performance, they're both respecting each other and in turn they want to continue with their relationship forward.
Now, this leads nicely into some um, fantastic research that has been done by some um, a PhD student and a couple of solicitors, which I've quoted on the screen there. Now, I guess first and foremost, I want to recognise the work that they have done. Um, I think the research that they've done is fantastic. Um, it is encouraging to see practitioners out there commit so much time to researching areas of the law that you know are controversial so I do take my hat off to, to these authors in terms of what they have produced and um, now my reading of their, their articles and again I've quoted them on the screen for you so if you do want to go do a bit of research yourself please feel free to do so but essentially my understanding of the author's arguments is that there is a statutory lifespan of caretaking and lending agreements and in the author's opinion that is for accommodation modules that there is the maximum term of 25 years and that they are only permitted one five-year top-up or extension for standard modules that's your 10 years plus one five-year top-up. Now, the argument is then that there are, there, there are capped or there is a cap on the number of extensions permitted and that extensions or top-ups, i.e. your subsequent right or option, cannot occur indefinitely moving into the future. Now, the explanatory notes um, that are referenced in these articles, but also the ones that are referenced in these slides, they do support a maximum term on the agreement. But the argument that the authors run is that essentially um, a statutory interpretation of section 130, specifically section 130 subsection two, provides for a singular right or option. Therefore, the total life of the agreement should not exceed um, 30 years for, for accommodation modules. The authors say that by using singular language and referring back to the explanatory material, that the argument of the maximum term should then be read down to 25 years plus a five year option. Um, and that um, ultimately after that time and after that's expired, the parties need to negotiate new and enter into new agreements. Now there's a lot of other research around these. these both these articles are about um, 18, 19 pages each. So there's a lot more that goes into this argument. But in a summary, that's what I read from, from, from the author's position. My thoughts on it um, and respectfully is that I don't agree with the interpretation of, of those sections per se. Um, yeah, it's not that I don't agree that there should be a cap on the agreements. I just don't read the legislation in the same way that, that the authors do read that legislation. It is, like I said from the outset, going to be a very interesting question to put before the tribunal and the courts. Um, and ultimately, until we have that decision handed down, it's difficult to be able to um, provide any type of advice or position on the merits of such an argument. Um, but in my opinion, that there, 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 there already is a cap that sits on these agreements. Um, and my position is that that cap is 25 years for accommodation modules. And the position should be that the body corporate, like what was held in, in Castaway Cove, doesn't have a mandatory obligation to extend past that 25 years or 10 years for accommodation modules. So a cap, in my opinion, does exist. Um, the, the difficulty that I see with this um, um, reading is that I just don't read it to be as clear to say that that, that, that subsequent right or option is capped at one. Um, and I explain why now. So I've had a look at some case law quite extensively about the interpretation. Um, and this is a statutory interpretation question. Um, but Mariners North was a decision that I came across that um, referred to a, a UK decision about the interpretation of legislation. And interestingly, in um, that case, the adjudicator referenced the following. The Privy Council took the view that if the legislature intended the provision to apply to take over of more than one company, then it would not have relied solely on the rule of interpretation, but would have made its intention clear. 
The decision or that decision that I referred to involved a very different factual circumstance and matrix. Um, and it could, and I recognise it could be argued in a number of different ways. However, I think that a reasonable analogy to draw from the above quote um, to the specifics of this webinar would be that if the legislature had intended for subsection two to be capped to permitting only one subsequent right or option for each originating agreement, um, it would have made that intention clear in that regard and in my respectful opinion on a plain reading of section 130 that intention is not clear for, for me particularly. Um, this is especially so um, given the relevant sections of the accommodation module um, including the fact that a subsequent right or option um, has to be considered by a body corporate at general meeting. So the body corporate has a say um, and it can choose whether it wants to extend that agreement or not. Um, it must be considered by way of secret ballot, therefore respecting the privacy and trying to promote um, owners to vote and not feel pressured for, for the adverse um, perhaps implications or consequences from that. Um, and also the requirement that it can only be considered once per financial year for the body corporate too. So I guess to, to, to the other point that I would make here is that I feel that this position is supported by the Acts Interpretation Act, but also most modern caretaking and lending agreements, um, whereby there are interpretation provisions found usually on about the second page. Um, and most of those interpretation provisions provide or, or say that words denoting singular also include um, plural and vice versa. I feel that that position can, can also be adopted to, to an interpretation of subsection two as well. Um, finally, on this point, and as held in the Castaway Cove decision, um, the decision as to whether or not to approve a subsequent right or option is one of the body corporates to make. Um, and unlike the common myth in the industry that caretakers are entitled to, to a subsequent right or option, owners do have a say. Um, and in my respectful opinion, they should be voicing it and using it. I'll summarise so that we can get onto some questions, Nikki. Um, but essentially, that there are a number of different schools of thoughts out there. Um, and I, I do think that it will be an extremely interesting test run to, to take to the tribunal to see where the tribunal sits on it. Um, and I think that if the committees um, are, are wanting to run this type of argument until we get that test decision and that test case through, we won't know the, the prospects or the merits of such an argument. Um, but in the meantime, and from a realistic viewpoint, um, my opinion is that owners and committees really need to um, be educated about what they are currently required and, 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 and tied to, um, and what do they have the discretion to vote against? Because my opinion is there is already a cap. It's a discretionary right on whether that maximum term is extended or not. Um, I recognise, as I've stated earlier, that there is a pattern and there are misconceptions and myths within the industry about this. Um, my respectful opinion is for that pattern to be broken, the industry either reads to require um, a question to be put to the tribunal about statutory interpretation of section 130. Um, there needs to be a further amendment to the regulation modules, which I think is unlikely given that we just saw them amended in 2020. Um, or more likely an education given to committees and owners um, about the circumstances of when it is reasonable to say no, um, what is discretionary and what is mandatory on them as well. That about concludes the webinar component, Nikki. Would you like to get into some questions? Excellent. Thanks so much, Jessica. That was really interesting. Um, thank you for sharing your thoughts on that. Do you mind just popping out of the, sh the screen share um, if you can? That'd be great. Cool. But um, yeah, that was that was great. And the arguments behind why you, you have those thoughts and it will be interesting to see what happens with those moving forward. I noticed you say in there, um, if anyone's willing to test this theory to get mm. in touch with you, definitely. I think so. it would be an extremely interesting case to run, Nikki, because um, yeah, ultimately, as far as research I can see, especially the research done by, by Neil Hope and, and his co-authors, there, there's no case out there that deals with this yet. And, and look, I'm, I'm not saying that there's no merit in the argument. I don't read it to be strictly that interpretation, but it would be extremely interesting to see where, where the tribunal would sit on it. 
Definitely. And I'm sure if that if that ends up happening, we'll certainly keep our readers. Um, yeah, we um, will. No doubt. <laughs> we'll hear from it. <laughs> Definitely. So that sounds good. That was yeah, very, very interesting. We've had some questions come through um, in the comments, but we did have a lot of questions that were submitted. Mm. And as you mentioned, we've got some really, really interesting ones. I'll just confirm to everybody that we will be providing a copy of that presentation when we send the recording out later. I know there was lots of information in there, and I'm sure many of you would like to go back and go through those slides um, one by one and sort of look up any of the um, the references that Jessica's pointing to. So we'll certainly get that through to you later today. But um, if you're ready, Jessica, we might jump into some of the questions. Sure. Okay, the first one we've got, this one is from Will. Many caretaker contracts have a vague scope of works. They may say the driveway should be cleaned once a week, but there's no reference to the standard. This can lead to disputes over the quality of work being done. How should committees approach conversations like this with caretakers? What's a good response if the caretaker says, that's not in my contract? Mm. Well, it, it's a great question from Will, Nikki, and, and one that we field a lot of um, because the, the common themes that we see in caretaking agreements is that the older the agreement, the more vague, the more broad, ambiguous the terms are or the duties are, the more modern agreements have what we call a specified duties list. And that specified duties list really does give the prerequisite um, particularization but also um, frequencies built in there. Now, I guess to, to, to answer Will's question, um, how can a committee approach these type of conversations? It will depend on whether they've been approached previously with the caretaker. If, if they have been approached and the caretaker has essentially responded with, that's not included in my contract, I'm not gonna be doing that. Um, the next step for the committee to consider would be to get a, an independent ma uh, management rights expert in to the scheme and to do it what's called a common property condition report. I think it's safe to say that most committee members would not have the prerequisite skill or knowledge as a management rights expert would do. And the difficulty we see is that there is always this argument of nitpicking. The caretaker says the committee's nitpicking, they're being subjective in how they're scrutinising our performance. And then the committee says, no, we just want it to be of the standard that we expect. So having a management rights expert come in there and do a common property condition report, it takes away that subjectivity. Um, it takes away that argument of nitpicking and the committee can say, okay, it's not us that is scrutinising you. We've got somebody independent in. This has been the report about the standard of the scheme and the condition of the common property. Can we table it and have a discussion with you about how how we can go about fixing this. There's two very different interpretations of your duties. And unless we work together to resolve them, we're gonna to continue to have these arguments about what you are or are not required to do. Now, depending on how those discussions go, um, if they go poorly, the committee might need to consider issuing a remedial action notice, but if they go well, um, the committee might engage in some private negotiations with the caretaker to say, okay, let's tidy this up. We don't agree. Let's get a specific schedule of duties prepared by an expert that ultimately says what you're required to do with, with a good satisfactory level of particularization and the frequency in which you're required to do it. And let's do a deed of variation, put it to owners so that we can resolve this moving forward. That to me would be a pragmatic commercial outcome for both parties. It's all about how you communicate it. And it's all about making sure that what starts as a performance-based issue doesn't escalate into a personality-based issue because of poor, poor communication there as well. So that's probably how I would deal with it first and foremost. And, and obviously my opinion with, with specific schedules of duties is they work for both parties um, sides because the caretaker then knows what he, she, it is required to, to do um, and the committee knows what, what is required and, and there's, a, there's an ability to check things off and not have different interpretations of things as well. 
I think you're on mute. Sorry. Sorry, I was too. So I didn't interrupt you during that session. Um, well, okay. uh, yeah, so the next one is from uh, Michelle, and it's very similar to the one that you've just spoken about. So I might just reduce it down a bit, but it's obviously someone sure. who's having trouble with the duties that are that are being performed by the caretaker. But within that question, you've just given us a really good process on how to deal with this situation. But um, in Michelle's uh, question, she asks if the caretaker does not perform the duties to committee satisfaction, um, mm. can there be a monetary fine for not completing satisfactory work mm. sure okay um i guess the simple answer is no not to my understanding um but i guess where where, where a committee can have their say um and, and and obviously i'm an advocate for the committee having their say and, and being involved in it and not just accepting things um as they stand um, and and what i will say to that is that there's not a monetary fine but by communicating and holding caretakers accountable to their performance you are creating um, documents sitting on body corporate records which um, then paint a picture for prospective buyers when they do their due diligence. So first and foremost, I'm an advocate for trying to work with your committee um, and with your caretakers. I think it's very important to be commercially minded in how you do this. Um, and I think it's very important to try to negotiate an outcome whereby both parties' interests are, are protected. If that doesn't eventuate, you can look at doing remedial action notices and ultimately for caretakers' purposes, or at least the feedback I get, is that if they have documents sitting on records, whether it's emails, whether it's letters, whether it's performance, um, uh, common property condition reports, remedial action notices, all of those documents sit on record. They're discoverable by prospective purchasers in their due diligence. And ultimately, prospective purchasers go, oh, I'm not only coming into an agreement that I have to get on top of all of new duties, a new scheme, everything else, but I'm coming into a relationship that perhaps is is fragmented um, and that can be seen adversely by prospective buyers as well. Um, they would ideally want to come into a scheme where there is a harmonious amicable relationship sitting there with the committee. So just because there's not a monetary fine doesn't mean that you know taking steps to make sure that the performance of the caretaker is met um, doesn't mean that you shouldn't do that. You should still do that. There are still, I guess, implied consequences of, of, a, of a caretaker just shrugging its shoulders and walking away from things. Great, thank you. Okay, we've got one from uh, Rachel. We are caretakers of a Queensland complex and our agreement mm. is currently at 12 years out of 25 in an accommodation module complex. The mm -hmm. disgruntled owner has put a motion forward to change the motion to a standard module. We know that this will affect our ability to sell whilst it's on the table, but what would the module change mean to residents? Approximately 20% of the residents are rentals, um, plus we have a number of lockups or owners who live overseas. Are there any strategies that have been successfully deployed to mitigate or defeat such a motion? Oh, that's, that's a good question. And, and one that we're seeing a, a lot of um, lately. Um, I'm seeing a, a, a big shift where committees are looking at changing their regulation module. Um, there is some requirements that I think that should be factored into what module is appropriate for the scheme. Um, and that is something that individual schemes should get some legal advice on. Um, you know, generally your short term holiday day let style um, high rises with predominantly leased lots is more tailored towards your accommodation module where your um, townhouse villa style mainly owner occupier um, lots is generally targeted towards your, your accommodation module. Um, oh, yeah, sorry, your standard module. I guess what are the repercussions for owners? Um, not a huge amount apart from the biggest kick being that the caretaking and letting agreements are capped at your 10 years. Now, obviously, Rachel, your, um, your term is currently at 12 years. You should certainly get some legal advice about what implications that change could have on, on your agreements. 
In terms of challenging it, it's an onus of an emotion. Um, it should be included on the agenda and that's what is required of the committee. The question for both the committee residents and, and yourself as a caretaker is whether there would be any grounds to challenge that motion, whether it's on the grounds of unreasonability um, or whether it's on the grounds that it conflicts with the Act or the module. Again, and unfortunately, that's something that you would need to get some independent legal advice about on that front as well. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, Jessica, we've also got one from uh, Susan saying, we live in a standard format plan and have a contractor who's responsible for taking care of gardens and the common property facilities. Should the contract be available to all owners to view on the strata managers portal? We're all along with other reports such as the AGM financial reports, etc. Can an owner request a copy of the agreement from the strata manager? At the previous AGM, we were asked to vote on a five-year extension to the original contract, but a copy of the contract was not provided for all owners to view. We have many new owners in the complex who did not live in the complex when the contract came into effect. So in other words, we were asked to vote on something that we did not have full information on. Mm, okay, another, another great question. So there's a few different components in there and, and I believe I'll, I'll answer all of these, Nikki, but if I miss any, please let me know. Um, first and foremost, I'm not entirely privy to what documents are readily available on, on Strata Managers portals. Um, but what I can say is that your caretaking and lending agreement, any subsequent deeds of variation or assignment are body corporate records and should be um, accessible by an interested party, whether that be an owner or, or likewise. So if you're not a committee member, then you'll need to make your, your application to your Strata Manager and your committee. You'll need to pay your prescribed fee and you can either obtain a copy um, by post, email, whatever, or you can go in there and inspect as well. So most certainly the original agreement should be accessible by interested parties and do form part of body corporate records. Um, the second question in relation to um, the deed of variation and whether the original agreement should also be attached to that. I briefly commented on this in the webinar. Unfortunately, there's no legislative requirement for the original agreement to be attached and circulated with your general meeting agenda. That's why the importance of the BCCM Form 20 comes into play because it acts or is meant to act as a summary of the nature of the amendment being sought. And it's meant to be able to give owners a, a snapshot one page idea about, okay, this is what is being requested. Do I agree or, or don't I agree? It's also, and I appreciate the frustration when you get a three page deed and it, you know, owners just go, okay, that, that should be fine. Um, again, it comes down to you as a, as a committee or, or your committee members, making sure that owners are educated about what is being agreed to. Um, and my opinion with any type of deed that is presented is that a committee should be getting legal advice on it even if you have a harmonious amicable relationship with your caretaker where you want to give them the five years because they're doing a fantastic job, so you want to retain them, even if that is the case, you need to get some advice about the legalities of the deed that's being presented. Are you asking to acknowledge or be or ratify previous options that you as a committee member that was just elected a month ago has no idea whether they were ratified or whether they were exercised correctly? So. Um, getting legal advice doesn't mean it has to be a dispute. Getting legal advice is just making sure that the body corporate's interests are protected in the deed as well. Was there another component to that? I think that was basically everything. I think you've covered most things in there, uh, Jessica. Okay. Yeah, I think that's fine. Okay, um, okay. Uh, the next one, uh, can a resident manager keep requesting new extensions each year? Yeah, <laughs> okay, so th this, this, is, this is the debate in the industry at the moment. Um, can there be indefinite top ups or is there a cap? My opinion on it is that there, there is the ability to seek a top up every financial year but it is the body corporate's decision as to whether that top up should be given to the caretaker or not. Um, now, Neil Hope and his respective authors say that there should be a cap. I know that there's other strata lawyers out there that take different opinions. 
my position is that yes, your 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 caretaker can put up a motion each financial year for an extension, but it comes down to you as owners, you as committee members, making sure that owners are educated enough to know that this is an additional right being given and they do have the ability and the right to reasonably vote no to that. Okay, thank you. And this is a, we might just, I think we've just got time for this last one. Um, and then any other questions that we have in, we will get back to people with answers. Um, and I'm sorry that we've run out of time. We've just had so many great questions come in. <laughs> um, so this one was from Nicole. Um, how do you think the quality of the existing working relationship between the voluntary committee of owners and the building manager impacts whether variations are granted or not? Oh. Look, it's a, it's a good question. It comes down to the personality disputes that I was referring to before. Um, I guess, look, I think it does have a huge impact on whether variations are granted or not. My opinion, generally, no matter what um, motion is being put to owners, if it comes with a committee endorsement, most owners follow suit on, on, on the committee and think, well, you're the ones that we appointed. We respect the work that you've done. You've got the day-to-day -day administration and operation of that body corporate. So if you're going to endorse something, generally owners that aren't member uh, committee members will, will support that position. So if there is a personality dispute between the committee and the caretaker, and if the committee takes quite a firm position on variations and the like, um, I genuinely see that that will impact the relationship insofar as owners probably won't vote for it either. I also see that that disconnect between the caretaker and the committee um, is disadvantageous for both parties because what was most likely started as, as a performance-based issue that could have been resolved with some training, with some good communication, has escalated into something that is now a personality issue. And my opinion is to fix that, you either need a change in the committee or you need a change in the caretaker. Um, because otherwise, you know, working out, you know, communication, policy, putting in mechanisms and the like, they're generally only effective to an extent. So to answer the question, I think there is there is a big impact if you have uh, a level of disharmony between your committee and your caretaker. Okay, and then we just another one last point if we've got time, Jessica, we had a sure. really quick discussion before we started. Um, mm. and we also spoke about the fact that we sometimes get questions in from lot owners who aren't on the committee and there's a disconnect between the committee and the yes. lot owner and the lot owner is yes. not agreeing with the committee's direction. And so can you, mm. um, so I think you came up with some really great information when we were speaking and I'd love to share that with the audience. Good. Thank, thank you, Nikki, for the reminder on that. And, and it was a couple of the other questions that came in where uh, ultimately owners are ex expressing an opinion that they don't agree that the, the caretaker is performing and ultimately they're not a committee member so they have really no influence in how that is going to be resolved. So they feel a little bit hamstrung about, well, what can I do? I want to do something, but my committee is not doing it because they're friendly or they're in cahoots with the caretaker. So two points that we discussed, Nikki, um, was under the new regulation modules, owners can now submit motions to be considered by the committee. So you've got the ability to submit up to six motions in a 12 month period. And my thinking with that is, well, you as an owner, you can go out and you can get a quote from a management rights expert to come in and do a common property condition report and you can draft up a motion which doesn't need to be anything too um, um, complicated and you submit it to your committee as, a, as an owner submitted committee motion to say I take issue with the fact that no work is being done you committee I want you to table and consider whether you will appoint a management rights expert to do a common property condition report and following on from that um, whether you will take some advice about where the body corporate sits from a legal viewpoint and that's one way to force a committee's hand and get your voice up the other way is to do an owner submitted motion to your AGM and let owners decide so if you're concerned that your committee will table the committee motion and, and ultimately vote no to it then take it to a general meeting and do an owner submitted general meeting motion again make sure you get your quotes in so it's a proper motion that the committee has to action um, but ultimately those two things the two recourses that you as owners can affect um, without the involvement of, of, of your committee if you're concerned that they won't participate in it. 
Excellent. Thank you very much for making that point. And I think that's a really great way to, to finish the session, Jessica. So thank you so much uh, for your time oh, today. Thank you, Nikki. That was fantastic. And for all of the people that have attended, thank you so much for attending and for, for being here to listen to that great presentation. As I mentioned, we'll get those um, notes out to you this afternoon with a recording of the session. And if you did submit a question, whether it came in by a chat, I think I've, I've copied them all down and um, kept a note of them. And also the questions that we didn't actually get to today because of time restraints, we'll certainly do our best to get that information back to you. And thank you, Jessica, for, um, for volunteering to, to get back to people about those. Not a problem at all. My pleasure. Okay, so at the end of the session, we always ask our guests if they've got something that they like to share with us. So, Jessica, do you have some information, something that's happening at Canon and Co Law that you'd like to let us know about? Some recent awards or something exciting that's coming up? Oh, look, I, I did have the pleasure of having um, Lauren Jones from our office last year be a finalist or, or actually win, sorry, I should say, the, the Queensland Essay Award. And um, I've got the pleasure of saying that Canon and Co has been nominated for, for the upcoming um, Queensland SEA Awards as well. So um, that's two big things that, that I think, you know, from, from a firm's point of view, we're, we're very proud of. Excellent. That's fantastic. Congratulations to Lauren and also um, good luck with the awards that are coming thank up. You. For Canon and Co. Thank excellent. you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Um, we'll leave it there. Um, we'll hopefully we'll see you at another session coming up. Keep an eye out for um, notes about our regular webinars. We'll, we usually push those out in all of our um, correspondence that we send out to you all of the time. So we'd love to see you at an event in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nikki, and thank you, everybody.